Well, good morning to you once again. It is uh, about 20 minutes to the top of the hour, which is 8 a.m. as we journey on uh, for yet the 14th of April, 2023. My name is Priscilla Regina Daloga. Uh, thank you so much for being in our company. Hashtag morning at NTV uh, for all the details to the conversations we are yet to deliberate upon this morning. One of them being the significance of documentaries in the arts industry. Now, we do have Robert Chagurani, who's a honorable a former member of Parliament and of course the president for the National Unity Platform, Elias Bobby Wine's documentary titled The People's President. It scooped two accolades at the Millennium Festival Awards recently and the documentary won the International Competition Audience Prize and the Best Film on Human Rights categories in this year's festivals that took place last Saturday in Belgium. Now Bobby Wine has used this his music to fight the regime led by Yuri Museveni and this particular film has acquired the National Geographic following its premiere at the Vince Film Festival, bringing this into aspect. The film, directed by Christopher Sharp and Moses Wayo, and produced by Sharp and Oscar winner John Batsek, follows the attempt by musician Bobby Wine to topple the regime, which is something that we are all familiar with now. How the two met, the producer and the person himself, well, they met back in 2017, just after the musician had become a member of parliament through a by-election for Chadondo East. Now I'm joined by Andrew Kagwa, who has been following these events, Time Memorial, and of course later on we'll be joined by another pundit who's a documentarist to help us understand how important arts is in influencing what happens in our country. Good morning to you, Kagwa. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. Now, let's first uh, start by understanding what a documentary is. What's the difference between documentaries and short films? Uh, when they are short documentaries, uh, they are short films, which uh, short films is necessarily any thing of motion picture that's below, mm, below, it's usually been 40 minutes but people are making them shorter these days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're they almost putting a cup of uh, 15 minutes, but it's supposed to be 40 minutes. Uh, well, short minutes could be real, could be fiction. And it's the same thing with features. Uh, now, the difference that there is with documentaries is that uh, documentaries are non-fiction stories that are captured on video. They they are captured at times in real time or at times in a form of people telling history but these are real events it's they are not being acted of course today more forms of documentary films have come up uh they are docudramas uh documentary dramas are not necessarily dramas mm -hmm. but it's dramatizing a documentary film like some of the parts that were not recorded, are reenacted by real life people. I think in Uganda, one of the docudramas we have is the one of uh, Chibwete, because I remember it was done by uh, Bat Kakoza, mm. where some people were reenacting the scenes. The events. While the real people that saw the events were doing the the overhead interviews. Okay, yeah. all right. Now let's talk about the People's President documentary. Uh, we were here last year, I mm -hmm. believe, and we had a conversation about um, its release and its appearance in uh, the Italy Festival mm -hmm. film Venice. Uh, in Venice. It was very impressive, yeah. you know. <laughs> and uh, we were eager to find out what were the details. It got the international community, especially in human rights, talking. Mm -hmm. But uh, you who has been relating with this uh, documentary mm -hmm. for a course of time, what is entailed exactly in the movie from what journey of his life to present? Uh, the movie tries very much to capture a lot but uh, the footage that's happening in real time because you see when you're shooting a documentary there are more times you're going to use archival footage things that are not happening in real time mm -hmm. but they actually happen to you uh, that's when you will start looking for photographers that took pictures of you at that time, people that captured your videos when you're still young and you're performing on stage. Those things that are not in real time, but they actually happen to you. That's archival footage. So the real time footage of this 
starts when Bobby Wayne was campaigning to join parliament in 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, much of the serious work around it started after he became an MP and they follow him through the campaigns of the presidency. So in a nutshell, they've been capturing Bobby Wayne for 2017, 18, 19 years. to the election. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's five years. All right. That's very interesting. I've, I've had the privilege of, you know, having a sneak peek into the documentary. Mm -hmm. uh, the earlier, you know, pictures and uh, photos that are shared mm -hmm. uh, for when he was still an artist mm -hmm. with his big dreadlocks mm -hmm. and uh, some of the pictures in there and videos that are shared of him smoking and, you know, <laughs> and then his brothers and close uh, mm -hmm. comrades uh, mm -hmm. come to tell of the journey and the transition mm -hmm. of the artist mm -hmm. into the politician and uh, uh, when he was uh, vying for that parliamentary seat, yep. he, he went in. The, I think there was a, the first uh, poster that came out had him having dreadlocks, mm -hmm. but then to the people's advice, it was if you're going to go political, you've got to be smart looking like your comrades <laughs> <laughs> that you will find in parliament. Therefore, cut off your dreads, something he w was obedient to, and he cut off dreads, winning the hearts of many. Which many? Uh, <laughs> no, no, okay, he got into parliament. It, it, it's, <laughs> it's quite a narrative that, uh, that you have to lose your dreads to kind of appeal to a certain group of people. Mm -hmm. Like it's basically one of the the tiniest things we, we have connected to our roots, I mean, people that have them. Uh, but uh, wha one of the most interesting things about this documentary is that it has had about, um, about four camera people. Like uh, Buayo, Buayo was just, uh, I think, the fourth and the final one, and then he stayed with the project to the end. Mm -hmm. uh, but many other people that came onto the project, the person that started the project actually uh, dumped it, kind of if I could use that language, he kind of dumped it because uh, the working environment became very tricky. Mm -hmm. Like say when you're foreign and you're operating in Uganda, it became tricky, he had to jump off a second one came, a third one, and then Buayo. And then, of course, even with Buayo, there were some challenges. Like, there was a time, I think he was arrested when he was still doing this documentary, mm. that, like, work had to stall for some time. But, yeah, going back to, to the question of um, him cutting the dreads off and winning the hearts of the people, like, of course, for me, that part in the documentary just shows you how we perceive hair and how hair says a lot about people. Uh, and in, in Africa, I think it's a very, very big deal. Mm -hmm. For instance, you could look at dreadlocks and you're thinking, when you're arrested in Uganda, the very first thing they will do is cut off your dreadlocks. Oh, as, really? As if they, they, the dreadlocks committed their crime. Yeah. It's the very first thing they would do. And then when police finds a group of people together, the very first suspect they would think would be the person with dreads. And yet they forget that the person with dreads has actually never been to jail because he has the dreads. Like, you guys cut them off. So, like, if I was in the shoes of the police, I would just, I'd actually be looking at the person without dreads. Mm -hmm. They are possible culprits. Probably they've been to jail once, and that's why they do not have hair. But they usually look at the person with dreads. So maybe for this documentary, that's why it was a very, very important part of them showing that like, yes. he actually had to lose his look mm -hmm. for a certain group of people to accept him. Because this side of the word hair means a lot. So represents a that's, lot. that's a stereotype um, in society. What other stereotypes do you feel are embedded in this documentary, The People's President? Uh, of course, the way Uganda as a country looks at, um, at, at creativity and creatives, because one of the things you will see is that when Bobby Wine showed up, he was written off by every political player. Like, he was written off, and then he somehow came as an independent. Mm -hmm. like you can just imagine someone that had been giving us music for more than a decade, like came as an independent because nobody seemed to really 
want to rub shoulders with to, him. Yeah, to rub shoulders with him. Until the last moment when they noticed, actually, the people wanted to go his side. So the way we look at uh, the create, creative economy in Uganda is something that is uh, highlighted with the documentary because everyone shunned him when he came up. Mm -hmm. But then besides that, throughout the campaigns in 2017 and then the campaigns in 2020 leading to the 2021 election, still the capture way too much when people kept saying Uganda is not a theater stage to hand it to a, to a musician. So that stereotype of how they think about art is something that is highlighted in the documentary. Okay. Andrew, you and I have had this conversation on the power of art, uh, looking at the history of the theatricals, mm -hmm. uh, some of the men and women uh, that actually came out to portray what was happening in their country mm -hmm. ended up disappearing, losing their lives. Mm -hmm. um, in the most recent times, people like Bobby Wine mm -hmm. uh, were able to use their art, their craft, singing about what was happening in their communities. Mm -hmm. And the expectation for people such as himself was that, let me sing about the plight of my communities mm -hmm. so that I can get the ear of the leaders to do something about it, mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, which has not you know, come forth, not just for him, but for at a cross. Mm -hmm. We don't seem to have uh, an understanding that arts is enabling leaders to realize what the plight of our society is and therefore pay attention to it and do something about it. I think art does its job, it communicates. And uh, trust me, the leaders actually hear, it's just that they choose to dance. Like they hear the message and they just choose to dance on the message. Mm -hmm. And it's not only happening in Uganda. Because uh, I think in uh, Kenya, uh, Eric Komondi, the comedian, has decided to take to the streets. And one of the reasons he has decided to take to the streets is because he believes when you put the message on the beats, you're only creating a hashtag. That people are going to talk about it, they will mm -hmm. hashtag about it, they will talk about it on Twitter. Until the next big thing comes Until and yours is washed thing away. Comes and then right. they move on. So like the message gets to the people it's just that the people that are supposed to act uh, just close their ears and dance they they won't care about the message but the message actually gets to them okay speaking of messages uh, what messages do do uh, are brought out uh, from this documentary the people's president uh when i think uh one of the things one will see i don't even know when every Ugandan will have a privilege of watching this documentary. Mm -hmm. But uh, when we actually get to watch it, one of the things we shall see is uh, he opened up his doors to these filmmakers. So they had a lot of access, one to the wife, uh, the children, and then him and his pest generally. So one of the things you see out is one, his He's a family man, mm -hmm. and uh, family is very, very important for him. And that's not just with the, with the children of his, but they are brothers and they are everything. And he has been working with all these people, literally, when he was even an artist. So that's something that's quite highlighted by the documentary and something you, you get to learn about him, mm. that family is key. Mm. Family is key, and family is quite a very important thing. Mm. All right, speaking of family, I know um, Mickey Wine, his brother, did make mention of something in the, in the documentary. He said that it's not about the dreads, it's about the brains. Uh, of which brains have won this best, <laughs> uh, this documentary in the festival. Two accolades in a country where mm -hmm. you see documentation is actually a serious hurdle for us. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the two accolades that it won. Uh, the two accolades uh, are most um, um, I know much about the last one. Mm -hmm. uh, one, we should notice that as a country, we do not win a lot when it comes to film. And uh, even when we win, most of the times, it's other people telling our stories. Like, we are not heavily involved in telling these stories. So. Personally, for me, one of the biggest things out of this is that uh, 
we are winning with a documentary that was partly directed by Buayo, who is mm -hmm. a Ugandan. Mm -hmm. For me, that's one of the most important things mm -hmm. with these two accolades. Mm. Okay, so onwards, um, how do we use this as a stepping stone to venture into documentation, especially for the yeah. arts industry? Because there's so many great artists out there, but uh, archiving and documentation of their work uh, will go unseen and unnoticed and unprotected. Mm -hmm. Archiving starts with the media. Unfortunately, yeah, like archiving. Oh, how, how does it start <laughs> with the media? Uh, one, when people are out there creating, they're just creating. The media is covering them. Right. Uh, it would be a very good deal if media actually covers and keeps. Trust me, it is very hard to find archive in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that because I've worked on a couple of documents, okay, not a couple of, uh, just two. Two, two is a couple. Mm. Yeah. J I've worked on two documentary films, and getting archive for those films has been one of the hardest things. And if I tell you that these are documentaries that are about subjects that are even still here with us, about things that happened probably in 2015, 2014, and it's so hard to find footage. Just imagine how hard it is going to be. So is it the case that the footage is there, but access to the footage or even the presence of footage itself is The footage minimal. doesn't exist. Like right now, if you try to look for original footage of uh, Eddie Kenzo coming back from the US after winning the BET award, mm -hmm. you will be so shocked that it will be hard to find original footage. Mm. What someone can help you with is a watermarked YouTube link. And if you go back to the people that posted the YouTube link, they will not have the original video. Mm. Like that's how bad we are doing when it comes to archiving. So the art industry in Uganda is not documented in word. Like we've not done many stories about it. And that's partly because we do not have very many arts journalists. Uh, like I know when you say it's not documented a lot by the journalists, people will look at you and they'll be like, what are you doing? But you, you can't document it all alone. Yeah. Like you need other people to, to work with you. So we've not documented it in writing and then we've not documented it in video. Uh, the way we are covering our industries about who's sleeping with who. Mm -hmm. uh, the who's bad things, the car. fights. The like th there is a way we cover industry in a trivial way so by that we can have an artist come they do a lot of good music and they stay with us and by the time they are done with us there is little we know about them like there are people who to, to date mm -hmm. I don't really seem to know who their real names are mm -hmm. but those people have been producing hits and that's mainly because no one has actually taken the time to give them that deeper interview. Mm -hmm. Like every time they appear before a screen, someone is going to ask them, so are you dating so-and-so? Right, yes, that's so, true. Like that, we never get a chance to know what their inspiration mm -hmm. is, why they produce this well, kind of music, what their background story is. What their is. background story is. That by the time they get out of Vogue, we do not know their stories. Now, that makes it harder for future people that will want to document these people, to document them, because there won't even be any archival footage to start with. Mm -hmm. Like, every time you try to look back at what these people did, you'll be finding videos asking them if they are sleeping with so-and-so, or if the car they saw them driving was theirs. So. As an industry, we yeah. are not archived. Actually, you're right, because uh, looking at the documentary that we're referring to here, uh, some of the footage of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Bobby Wine's story is picked from Spora, uh, which mm -hmm. was uh, a vlogger at yeah. the time yeah. uh, in the USA, right? Yeah. And so when he visited the USA, she had that interview, you know, just poking into his mm -hmm. past. That's the footage that's being used. Uh, very minimal Ugandan footage is being used. So you do have a point. No, the mere fact that it's not even coming <laughs> from Uganda. <laughs>
<laughs> the mere fact that much of the footage is not even coming from Uganda right. tells you a lot. Right. And yet, you could imagine people had a lot of chances of sitting down with Bobby Wine to talk, but every time they sat down with him, probably they asked him about what Bebeko was saying. Mm. And then he would answer back. Oh. How beneficial is documentation? How beneficial is archiving mm -hmm. uh, of our times present that when they become history, they will still be important, mm -hmm. Andrew? Uh, like, like just to, before I answer that, just to veer off a bit, uh, you know, I don't know if you've been following some of the conversations that are going on on Twitter at the moment. Uh, there is a very big argument between of course we who people call conservatives and other people because um, I don't know if you've heard uh, Watoto is trying to remodel their yes. building. Yes. They're trying to put up on a new Kampala one Road. Mm. on Kampala Road and um, one of the things that were my argument was I do not really care about them tearing it down and putting up a new one, mm -hmm. but I care a lot about them keeping the face of this one, mm -hmm. much as the inside can be different, because the face of this one is part of Uganda's history. history. And people do not get it. And the history is it being the first cinema hall yes, in the country. It being the first cinema hall. Mm -hmm. So people do not get it, because I think as Ugandans, many of us are very uncultured, we do not value history, we do not value maintaining it or keeping it. So how that ties into archiving, yeah. like I think it comes down to how we as a people. Uh, the mere fact that we do not read a lot, mm -hmm. the mere fact that uh, we see a book and uh, the very first thing we want to do with it is take a picture with it and actually read the book, mm -hmm. says a lot about us. Well, so, mm. so when it boils down, we do not respect keeping records. So it's the same way we treat our archive. Mm -hmm. Like there are people that are photographers, they are probably photojournalists, but they take pictures and they take very many pictures. Probably they are taking pictures on the front line. And uh, when the card is full, they format and take pictures again mm -hmm. because they do not know the importance of actually having these pictures that they've already taken. They do not know that a time will come when someone is actually looking for a picture of Bessie getting arrested and probably you're the only person that has that picture. And the good thing is that no one is even going to take it for free. Mm. Someone is actually going Willing to, to pay, pay the for price, it. Yes. But they will fail to find it. Like, there is a lot of footage that is very, very hard to find in Uganda, not simply because they were not taken, but because people that took them, after they served the paper, so probably after they were printed in a newspaper, they, they deleted, deleted the picture it. and moved on. Well, the, the argument will be that they don't have space. It's not their job to, to keep them and things like that. But uh, coming back to the question of what are the benefits either way? The benefits... Uh, the benefits are long term most of the times. One, as a person, you will never know when someone needs a certain picture. You will never know. And most of the times, by the time they get to you, they've moved and moved, and they are willing to pay the price. Mm -hmm. But uh, for the country, as a country, you as a society, you as a people, you cannot plan for the future when you do not know your past. Like. It's a hoax mm -hmm. that you're going to plan, you're going to think about the future, or you're going to, to ably want to do things better in the future when you do not know what was done in the past. I think one of the issues we are struggling with when it comes to music is, do you notice how a lot of Nigerians are starting to borrow from their older music when they are producing music? How Americans are borrowing a lot from their older music when they are producing music? How they are sampling each other a lot? And in Uganda, we rarely do that because there is no music There's no to foundation sample. of appreciation. Like, the music has been done, but after some time, the producer will delete the originals. And we get to that level where you find William Mukabia, but William Mukabia doesn't have William Mukabia's first album. Wow. 
and he does not know where the album is mm. because mm -hmm. He and even if he was to trace, probably the producer at the time has passed on. Yes. Like, yeah, things have happened in between there. So it becomes for us, it becomes hard for us as a society to keep going forward. It's like every time mm. we are building afresh. So for me, I would say that's the important of archives. Okay. It's important to know that. Uh, let's past. talk about the professionalism that was aided in producing this documentary from 2017 uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> till it was released. That's a long time, five yeah. years of daily coverage, of covering uh, the different elements of his life that turned out to make who he is today. Mm -hmm. um, in Uganda, do we have what it takes to produce yet another one of its kind? <laughs> uh without having to rely and call Bwayo all the time? Because, anyway, one of the things I think, uh, documentary films are very unrewarding, like, that's the truth. Uh, one, Ugandans think documentary films are boring, and I do not really blame them for that. Documentary films are not boring, though. Uh, it's the very first people that made us access documentary films that killed the vibe out of them. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I think those people are even watching us, NGOs, like they had these documentaries that had what you would call poverty porn, like a woman with a crying child and... And <coughs> some <coughs> flies all over some her. Some flies all over her. Yeah. And then there's all a voiceover, like Annette wakes up every morning. Oh, so, right. So time came when we were tired of seeing that. And for some reason, we started thinking all documentaries are the same, all documentaries are that boring, mm -hmm. all documentaries are sad, and mm -hmm. they're not entertaining. But uh, documentaries are more than that. Now, I, I don't even remember the question because... <laughs> <laughs> the professionalism, do yes. we have what it takes to produce more of these documentaries? Yeah, so in a country like Uganda, where even feature films are not making money, it becomes harder to make a documentary film because a documentary film makes money when it's bought, when it's bought by a distributor. Okay. Uh, for example, when someone bought uh, Afrobeats, uh, The Journey, uh, that's uh, an Afrobeats documentary, or The Journey to the Beats, which is also a history of Nigerian music. Both these, doc these documentaries were bought by streamers. One was bought by Showmax, the other one was bought by Netflix. The difference is in Uganda, where we are a very small economy, it is so hard for someone to pick interest in a subject that's not Bobby Wine. Because Bobby Wine is almost world renowned, mm -hmm. it's very easy for very many Africans to want to see his story. Mm -hmm. uh, if I did a documentary, say, about uh, another Ugandan politician. Regardless of how inspiring these people will be, it might be so hard mm -hmm. for me to find a person that wants to buy the documentary. But then, of course, looking at the fact that Boyo was working with a team of people that have experience, one either working as um, documentary filmmakers at a bigger level. Like, I do not know if any other Ugandan filmmaker will have that privilege, but most of the times it comes down to the subject matter, like how big is the subject matter marketable beyond yes, the country. Yes, that's very true. Like, the moment you have that... That, that would attract a click for the yes. distributor buying it. The moment you have that, there is a way you will actually try to move on even without the money. I mean, there is a documentary about uh, Eliud Chipchoge. Uh, the documentary follows his training. You know, mm -hmm. he did that mm -hmm. um, marathon sub two hours where he ran for, he ran a marathon for one hour and 59 minutes. But it is easier to sell such a documentary because Chipchoge broke a record. It was a world record. He's a world-renowned marathon. So it's it's easier to sell it's that. It's attractive. It's it attractive. Mm -hmm. So in Uganda, I think the next big person to sell a documentary about could be um, Joshua Cheptege. I agree. Yeah.
Okay, <laughs> so let's talk about casts, uh, movies, documentaries here in Uganda. I think they're taking a new height from mm -hmm. where I'm seated. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're seeing them starting to sell outside Uganda, or mm -hmm. even being appreciated by some markets, both on the continent and uh, beyond the continent, which brings the question of how is the future of the film industry for us tapping uh, into the opportunities out there? Mm -hmm. I think um, when Yellow Jump, the girl in the Yellow Jumper came out mm -hmm. during COVID-19 mm -hmm. on Netflix, it, it was, the reaction was not as expected. The criticism was actually more than the appreciation mm -hmm. of how did he end up there. Uh, but the fact that he easily, you know, met the right connections and got mm -hmm. him there, uh, today he has also been able to produce another, d be a top producer on one of another Nigerian big film. Mm -hmm. And so you see that the wings. And, and a shot for Netflix. And a shot for Netflix. Mm -hmm. So what? What's the future for us here? Uh, ah, okay, I do not want to sound negative, but um, uh, one film is very rewarding if there is an audience. I think Uganda as an audience is just a small audience. Okay. Uganda's small audience comes down to a fact that we we are a very small market by design. I say by design because Uganda is the size of the UK, or not the UK, but the size of England. Mm -hmm. But England is a big market because by design, they try to be a big market. How do you kind of create a big market? One, you make sure you do not have one center point. You make sure everything in your country is not happening they in one place. There are many cities in you which, many cities. of those many cities, there's uh, cinema halls in those yes. cities of which there's um, independent mm. bodies yes. that cater to those cinema halls the, and the appreciation the of more, arts. The more cities you have, or the more places yeah. that you have that are but empowered. But ASEAN Kampala with our one capital city. Mean <laughs> that there are more people that will yeah. be empowered. Probably you've been in Kampala and you have NTV, but there is Gulu and they also have their NTV, mm -hmm. which is also doing big business, just like the NTV in Kampala. Right. So we do not have that as a country. So everything happens in Kampala. So when someone is producing a film or someone is releasing a film, one of the places they are thinking about where it's going to be is in Kampala. You're not thinking about it being in Gulu. I mean, I don't know if Gulu even has a cinema. Actually, I with. think the, the, the best that we have tried to see that do is uh, first stage a big concert here in Kampala, then you do the regional tours, so yeah. of which they, they but don't again, really even bring when back you, home when, much. when you look at the regional tours, I do not think people in those regional tours can give a musician uh, 50,000 per head. Definitely not. So the mere fact that that just shows you the difference. So yeah, we are a very small market by design. Okay. And because of that, we do not actually get a chance to, to play bigger. So it's so hard for someone to invest a lot of money in a film because they will not get it back. Which means as an industry, it's going to be so hard for us to break the ceiling when it comes to the money we are spending. Mm -hmm. One, no one is going to spend a hundred million on a film because they are not going to make it back, whether they like it or not. And trust me, even if very many Ugandans show up to see that film, like it will be so hard for that film to make you that money back. Yeah, because I, I see it just, best example would be the theater here. Someone has put out a play in the theater and they have, you know, printed many tickets. But you find one booklet is really tickets to give away for free so mm -hmm. as to create quorum. Yeah. 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 So, so it, it goes back, like, we, we are a very small market. So the only future we have, one, we are doing well when it comes to TV because TVs countrywide and like like TV being countrywide that means if someone is paying their 60,000 in Gulu mm -hmm. they're going to watch each and everything the TV gives them so we've been doing well on TV uh, a lot of local dramas are coming through and people are watching them okay. uh, with streaming we are yet to do that well and one of the reasons why we're not doing that well with streaming is because 
many streamers do not want to give us the opportunities. Uh, and, and, and also, uh, I think one of those other challenges is that we as Africa are not designing our own streaming platforms. Yes. Uh, you do have Netflix becoming African, but it's really not African. Yeah, but we, we, we have <laughs> Showmax. the Asians will also think it's Netflix Asia and things like we, that. But we, we have Showmax, which is basically from South Africa, mm -hmm. by multi-choice. Mm. But again, Shomax will not take a chance with Uganda because we are a small market. Uh, one of the things someone will be thinking about is how many subscribers do you have okay, so in Uganda? So th you've mentioned small market over and over again. We can't change that, Andrew. We can't. We, we can't ch we so might not can be we able do? to change it in our lifetime. Uh, so what can we do? One, we have to work with other people. We have to work big. Say instead of producing a document for i can produce a documentary about uganda for the love of uganda and uh, probably for the fact of telling a story but if i want a documentary to be bought i'll tell a documentary about east africa where okay. i will be able to document saudi soul a bit of diamond and a bit of chameleon okay that is easier to sell than me trying to do a documentary about uganda when it comes to film if I want to make a film, I'll go and look out for Brenda Wairimu, top actress in Kenya, mm -hmm. look out for a top actor in Tanzania, and probably get a Nigerian on board, such that, and then create a universal story that's not authentically Ugandan. Like, I know people love that whole thing. Tell an authentically also Ugandan story. Also, it makes story. sense why you do have, um, you know, that... Uh popular series in which Zari is, uh, they got superstars yes. from yes. different countries uh, to attract a communal market. Yes. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, so we have to be thinking like that. We have to be thinking global. Because we are a small market, mm -hmm. we shouldn't be thinking local when we are producing. We have to be thinking global. All right, think big. Thank you so much, Andrew. So in your closing remarks, significance of documentation and archiving in the arts <laughs> industry, moving forward. Moving forward, one, we need to tell those stories uh, in the easiest way possible. One, I think at the moment we do not have the resources to tell a documentary like uh, Tinder Swindler. Mm -hmm. But we shall get there. Uh, when we get the right story, there are some right stories that can be attractive to the global market. I mean, if there is one story that's grabbing the world attention at the moment, it's a local story from South Africa about this guy faked his death, then escapes and somehow gets arrested in Tanzania on Good Friday. That, like, on any other day, that would have been a local story, but the complexity around mm -hmm. how he did it, like captures everyone and even in Uganda as a country I believe we have some of those stories mm -hmm. so going forward yeah there are some stories we have to tell like if it's a filler retire story we have to tell those ones for the love of documenting them uh, Eddie Wamala's story we have to tell those for the love of documenting them and then of course please show up every time people have these documentary showcases personally I run one uh, we call it until the documentary showcase. Ali Mutaka runs one, it's called Kampala Documentary Film Festival. Like, let's show up for these things. Okay. Like, you'll be so shocked of how differently people are telling documentaries right now. Like, I know every time someone hears the word documentary film, the very first thing that comes to their mind is there is a poor woman flies around and she's saying my husband doesn't leave food at home and then there is a white man's voice talking over it and she has to go to the market every day but there is more to documentary film than that like we've moved past that whole narrative of like it's an NGO thing. Mm -hmm. We are telling very interesting stories mm -hmm. so people should show up every time someone is calling or has a showcase of documentary films. All right. Thank you so much, Andrew Kagwa. Of course, your submissions have been very enlightening. Uh, one of them being that we've got to think global. Let's work with other partners uh, from within the region or even the continent or even tap into um, the diaspora and find out people who are actually making things happen on the diaspora level because they have more skill, more exposure. Uh, add it with what you have, you can definitely produce something that can be attractive for the 
the international market as we have seen the people's president uh, this morning now of course speaking of the diaspora we are going to be looking to the North American Ugandans coming together and we do have some aspirants that we're going to be talking to in regards to leadership for Ugandans living in North America right after this break stay with us